This week on Quality Digest Live, we chat with Chad Keimel of Omnex Systems about enterprise quality management via ISO 9001, AS9100, and other key standards. Plus, we take an up-close look at Fowler's one-of-a-kind mobile tech center. That more when we come back. <laughs> Welcome back to Quality Digest Live. Sorry for that little technical hiccup if you saw that. This is QDL for April 7th, 2017. And of course, QDL is your weekly look at who and what is making the news in the world of quality. I'm Mike Richmond, publisher of Quality Digest. And I'm Quality Digest Editor-in-Chief, Dirk Ducharme. And if you didn't hear what I said before, here it is again. <laughs> um, a lot of you have multi-site companies, you know, multiple, multiple locations for your company. And so, as you know, implementing QMS standards, sometimes multiple QMS standards can be a pretty daunting task. Uh, due to the aggressive time frames for implementing standards, which in many industries can be 12 to 18 months, organizations in multi-site environments are shying away from implementing an integrated management system and instead are looking at using enterprise quality as a first step toward an integrated system. And here again to tell us what that means is Chad Keimel, CTO and founder of Omnex Incorporated. Hi, Chad. Hey, hi, Dirk. All right. Hi, well, guys. Hey. Well, we're back. All right. Uh, first of all, uh, why don't you just explain to us the difference between an enterprise quality and an integrated management system? Absolutely. So let me start off by just saying that you know, timelines are very short, especially for those of, you know, folks that are doing AS9100 and or, you know, IATF 16949, deadlines are between a year to 15 months. So, you know, Omnex, you know, we, we've come up with a, about 10 different strategies for implementing quality right. One of that, of course, is integrated management systems. But as we work with companies, and we're working with global companies, multi-site companies, many of them are electing not to go integrated management systems. So point number one would be, if you're going to plan, plan beyond just certification. Plan like a three-year cycle. And Dirk, as you mentioned, you know, the time is now, if you want to really reduce your implementation timeline, and you want to do you want to go with enterprise quality. What does enterprise quality mean? A single quality manual. Now, as you know, in AS9100 and IATF 16949, you do need a quality manual. And of course, in most of us, you know, when you're a large company like that, you are, you're going to have documented processes. So have a common set of processes float out within the company. And then you can you know, set strategies on how to do common work instructions. And of course, when you do common processes, do common forms and checklists. So Dirk very simply said, it is a strategy when you have short time frames and you want to implement you know, in a multi-site uh, you know, environment, we say go enterprise quality. Well, Chad, maybe you can give us the, the value proposition here a little, little more deeply because people might ask, well, why would I choose enterprise quality versus an integrated management system? So the integrated management systems is the right way to go. It saves the most amount of money. And as you know, I have you know, been a part of presenting multiple times about uh, you know, integrated management systems, wrote a book for ASQ on integrated management systems. But when you don't have the time or there's no political will to bring in environmental and health and safety systems into one common management system, then the way to go is enterprise quality. And uh, Turk, I, or was it Mike, I don't know if I fully answered your question. Go ahead and ask me that question again. Well, I, no, I, I, think, I think you did. I, I think what you're saying is, uh, is the, the right way to do it if you had, you know, if you had the resources and the political will and so forth, that the right way to do it would be to do an integrated, integrated management right. system, but sometimes that just, that just isn't yeah. feasible. feasible. So, you, so in, in, in that place, you're, you're using an, an enterprise 
uh, quality management exactly. system kind of as, as, a, as present, a precursor, as a, as a first step? Yes, and you, you make the savings with the enterprise quality also. But of course, if you just let every site do what it wants, what's going to happen is the implementation is going to take that much longer and the cost is going to go up that much. So an example I'm going to present to you of an actual example that we worked out for one of our customers is there's a, you know, uh, the savings from a enterprise quality for one site is $200,000. The maintenance cost being the biggest cost savings, okay? And it's about 330 or something like that for the integrated management system. So integrated management systems are good, it saves money, but enterprise quality also saves money and it behooves us and it cuts short our implementation time. So we should do in at least enterprise quality as a first step on our way to integrated management systems. So. And is there much duplication of effort? I mean, if you, if you do, if you do the, the enterprise quality management system, and then later you're going to go do an integrated. Is there? Are you going to be doing a lot of stuff over again, or just a little bit of stuff over again? There will be a. If you didn't do it at all and you went there, there's a lot of work to do. But if you do enterprise quality and then you do integrated management systems, and most importantly, Dirk, you know what we are recommending is enterprise quality software that can be used to become integrated management systems. If you take that approach. And then you also will talk to you a little bit about how to do common work instructions. Again, the you know web-based software with a number of processes. So you can see from my article, I think I talk about about 15 to 19 different web-enabled processes. This will save significant amounts of money. I, I really, when I said about 200,000 and 300,000, I didn't actually bring in all the savings I'll try to present that next week, Tuesday, when I roll in the savings of, um, you know, if you have, if you're doing FEMAs and control plans, and you're bringing on new products using these, which is the way to go for parts per million defect reduction, then really, you know, enterprise quality software is you really need that as a first step, and then you can upgrade in the software to integrated management systems also. The same software can be used for that. And then of course you need to have the methodology to integrate. Well Chad, you, you alluded to it. We're, we're doing a webinar on this topic, as you mentioned, uh, this coming Tuesday on, on April 11th at, at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, 11 a.m. Pacific. It's, the title of the webinar is Enterprise Quality Management, ISO 9001, AS9100, ISO 13485, or IATF 16949, Implementations Made Easy, and Chad's going to present, Dirk's going to host. Uh, Chad, you mentioned your article as well. If, if folks want to register for that, they can check out your article right below the player page right down there, and uh, they can they can register. For and it. I so believe there's also on the player page, I think there's also a link on the player page right. to register for the webinar as well. So Chad, uh, once again, thanks for joining us. Thank you guys. Always okay. a pleasure. Okay. We'll see you on Tuesday. <laughs> see you in China. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thanks, Chad. <clears throat> All right. You know, um, as customers ask for more fuel efficient ve vehicles or maybe high performance sporting goods, uh, maybe a, let's say a, a carbon fiber road bike, for instance. Sure, nice. Nice expensive bikes. R uh, Ryan, um, Ryan would like that. <laughs> yes, Ryan would like that. Um, <laughs> What, what that drives is, is, is as customers are looking for that, manufacturers now are then tasked with developing lightweight energy saving composites that won't crack or break even after prolonged exposure to environmental or structural set, uh, stress. So I mean, what they're trying to do in order to meet customer requirements is create products that are lightweight and resilient. And composites have been kind of the, the go-to solution for a long time, uh, carbon fiber just as an example. The problem is that it's been difficult to measure damage caused to composites that are put under stress and to understand how they respond to stress. It's important to understand how and when what type of damage occurs under stress in order to produce better products. 
And in composites, this damage occurs at the interface of where the fiber and the polymer meet. So you, you know, carbon fiber, you've got, you've got these carbon fibers and there's some sort of epoxy uh, polymer base. And where those join, kind of at the surface of where the fibers join the polymer, that's where the damage occurs under stress. And until recently, the only way to look at this damage was using optical imaging. The problem is conventional methods for optical imaging are only able to record images at scales as small as 200 to 400 nanometers. But some of these interfaces I just talked about are only 10 to 100 nanometers in thickness. So optical inspection isn't going to do you any good. Uh, there's there's going to be damage that we haven't really been able to examine. So of course, the folks at NIST have developed a way to embed a nanoscale damage sensing probe into a lightweight composite made of epoxy in silk. The probe, known as a mechanosphore, could speed up product testing and potentially reduce the amount of time and materials needed for the development of many kinds of new kinds of composites. So the NIST team created their probe from a dye known as rhodamine spirolactam, or RS, and the characteristic of this, of RS, is that it changes from a dark state to a light state in reaction to an applied force. In their experiments, the NIST experiments, the molecule was attached to silk fibers contained inside an epoxy-based composite. As more and more force was applied to the composite, the stress and strain activated the RS, causing it to fluoresce when excited with a laser. And although the change was not visible to the naked eye, a red laser and a microscope built and designed by NIST were used to take photos inside the composite, showing even the most minute breaks and fissures to its interior and revealing points where the fiber had fractured. And I think we've got a slide here that shows that. <clears throat> We can put that up on the screen there. Yeah. So on the lower right hand corner, so in the uh, in slide B there, it says 20 microns. That is no, uh, th it's not exhibiting any signs of stress at that point. C is showing um, some signs of stress. And then uh, D is showing uh, stress uh, actually almost at the breaking point. And you can see all sorts of cracks and fissures at the nanoscale level. So this is something that hasn't been done in the past. So this is something that's going to be very useful going forward. Uh, the research team plans to continue searching for more ways that damage sensors, such as the one in this study, could be used to improve standards for existing composites and create new standards for composites of the future, ensuring that these materials are going to be both strong and reliable. So this gives, this gives people who make composites uh, and who design tools with them or design products from them a way to really stress test them and to see how they perform under uh, adverse uh, circumstances. So uh, good stuff. Ten, yep. 10 nanometers, you said? Um, uh, yes, down, well, the, the, interface, the, the interface is in that 10 to 100 nanometer range, which they haven't been able to look at before. So this allows them to see, uh, looking at the photo, I'm guessing somewhere uh, just under 100 nanometer range, they can actually see these little cracks and fissures that's, and stuff. That's, that's pretty crazy. That's yeah. crazy. Have yeah. you ever been to NIST? And get no, I'd love to go to NIST. We, we should try to do I know. one of these days. It's not <laughs> close to us. It's all the way on the other side of the country. But, uh, but that would be a fascinating uh, show. That would be an awesome show. I don't show. know if they'd have us or not. But hey, come on, guys. Come on. We want just an invite to NIST. That would be... Yeah, <laughs> it's not like it's a government agency or anything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, what do they have to hide? Come on. I got a low clearance. I got a low low. Security clearance. I'm lower, lower than you. I'm only five eight. <laughs> All right, thanks, Derek. All right, got well, my TSA pass. Come on. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Quick check or fast, fast pass. Fast fast or whatever that is. Yeah. All right, thank you, Derek. All right, well, infrastructure, another important topic that's been uh, getting a lot of attention lately. And uh, last month, the American Society of Civil Engineers released their grade for the state of the infrastructure in the United States, and the survey says D plus. Ouch. <laughs> wow, that's rather <laughs> unimpressive. I mean, it looks like uh, our President Trump is right and that we need to throw maybe a trillion bucks or so at the problem. California uh, is probably more like an F. <laughs> oh my gosh, D, D plus. Well, uh, it actually gets a little worse than that because if you look at the, the ACSE, uh, I'm sorry, ASCE report card, uh, you'll see uh, that there's individual grades for the various elements that make up American infrastructure. For example, Personally, I found it shocking, maybe not so shocking, maybe not so surprising, that our drinking water systems were allocated a D grade. That's even worse than the infrastructure as a whole. <laughs> right. A D grade, think about that. 
for many of you engineers out there probably never got a D grade in your life. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> some of us English students did. But uh, no, a D grade, I mean, you think about that. I mean, a D grade for our drinking water. I mean, is this is this the United States or is this Angola? <laughs> I mean, what 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 is this? I mean, consider our poor fellow citizens in Flint, Michigan. They, they've surely they been F. wondering yeah. over the past year if they live in a first or a third world country. Yeah, they've got an F, F minus. <laughs> for their drinking water. I mean, drinking water, it's essential. I mean, of course, obviously, this is obvious. Uh, it's essential to a healthy citizenry, but access to clean water is also of critical importance in many manufacturing uh, uh, places. And and a degrade for this vital resource, it's just, it's just unacceptable, you know? Yeah. I mean, it, it's such a vital part of what we do, what we need to have in this country. Well, uh, the National Association of Manufacturers is addressing this issue head on. Recently, NAM met with President Trump you may have recalled that in the news, and they expressed their support for his campaign commitments to infrastructure spending. NAM underscored these recommendations in their Building to Win blueprint, which was released right around the same time as the ASCE report card. In the NAM blueprint, they suggest the following budgetary allocations to U.S. infrastructure. And this is, this is interesting to see how they break this out. $629 billion for highways is what they recommend, $112 billion for bridges, 75 billion for aviation, 15 billion for ports and inland waterways, 86 billion for public transportation, and 52 billion for passenger and freight rail. So if you add all that up. So like about a trillion bucks. It's just about a trillion bucks. And what is coincidence? That's what Trump said he wants in infrastructure spending is a billion bucks. Now, it's, it's amazing how those numbers just kind of It's amazing how, how the NAM people just said, so, yeah, without you any know, influence. I think we need about a trillion bucks. <laughs> well, you know, line items, you know how these things go. A billion bucks there and there, yeah, yeah. you're talking about real money. Well, some would ask if all that is necessary or if we can even really afford it as a nation, but that trillion dollar investment would really only bring us partially back to the levels of infrastructure investment in the past. NAM's Building to Win Blueprint, uh, again, offers us the following chart. I want to show this to you because I think it's really interesting. And it shows the public and private investment in infrastructure since 1970. And the Oof. chart's right there. As you can see, the light blue shaded area represents private capital investments. And the dark blue shaded area represents public capital investments. So both are down significantly uh, from, again, this is, this is 1970 to, to 2012. And you can see that it's not significantly over that period of time as, as a percentage of, of potential GDP. Uh, the moral of the story is that funds are very much needed. And according to NAM, those needed funds uh, are gonna greatly benefit industry, not to mention people. Uh, we'll have to keep our eyes on the budget battles up in Washington going on right now to see if the money actually ends up being allocated or not. But, but we really hope to see some movement here uh, at some point this year. I mean, it's a critical issue. I mean, wow. a, I mean, a trillion dollars. So it's like half, half, looking at that yeah, chart, it looks chart. like about half. About half of it D now GDP versus right now versus, versus, uh, yeah, whew, man. <laughs> now that's not a trillion dollars, but as a percentage of the GDP. Yeah, you're right, right, yeah. It, it is. Yeah, right, and yeah. I mean, that that's a huge decrease. And I mean, I, I don't, there's not going to be a trillion dollars allocated. In no, no. no there's no, there's no bloody way. But there should yeah. be some. Yeah. There should be some because it's a crying need. And the water, yeah. the water thing in particular jumped out at me as being just an egregious yeah. example of that. All right. Well, we promised you earlier that we're, we're going to bring you a tech corner. And we, we haven't brought you a tech corner in a little while. And that's just because we've been keeping our powder dry. That's it. For this one. <laughs> this, is a, this is a great one. This is a fun little segment. So we're scoring. Have, we're sticking to it. How come right here? Well, our good friends at Fowler, uh, High Precision, have something very cool rolling across the country right Literally. now. Literally. Um, their mobile tech center, uh, actually, they've got three of them, I think, in the U.S. And, and if you haven't seen one of these babies, they're pretty cool. They, they were, one of them was at Fowler's booth at IMTS right. last September. You remember we walked yep. through, uh, many of you probably did as well. Uh, Fowler's mobile tech centers are basically tricked out RVs. They're tricked out with high precision uh, measurement equipment on them, and they can roll up to a facility and provide uh, extremely high accuracy measurement of your work pieces pretty much right on the spot. Pretty cool thing. So John Philippides of Fowler brought their West Coast Mobile Tech Center to us here in Northern California yesterday, and he and Dirk ran through some of the equipment that's on it. So let's take a look right now. Yeah, uh, Mike, right now we're standing outside of our studio uh, and we're at the Fowler Mobile Tech Center and with me right now is John Philippides. And John, this is basically a van that what goes across uh, different territories and shows off your stuff? Basically, this is the uh, Fowler Mobile Tech Center. It's designed to go directly to the end user and show off some of our more automated, harder to get around equipment. Um, the RV is the size of it is so it can fit all of your automated systems, hike gauges, bore gauges, um, just a plethora of different items. 
um, that the customers get to just kind of have on the bus. So. And you, you got three of these, I understand, one for each of your sales regions, is that right? Yep. So this is the western one. We have one in the central region and also in the eastern region as well. Okay, we're great. Well, let's t go inside and take us a look and uh, show us what you got there. Okay, John, what, what's the first thing that we're going to take a look here inside your, uh, your mobile lab? So this is the Bowers line of bore gauging. It's the premier uh, bore gauging manufacturer in the world. Um, essentially, we have you know a couple different ways to measure bore gauging. It goes from a couple thousandths of an inch all the way up to 15 feet, um, depending on the uh, instrument you're using. The line that we're going to be specifically looking at is the XT3, which uh, ranges from 80 thousandths to 12 inch. Uh, the XT3, 80 thousandths to 12 inch, can be used in an analog style, so your XTA, analog ratcheting style, your XTD, which is your digital ratcheting style, and then the most popular, XTH, which is your uh, digital pistol grip style. And these are all modular, it looks like. Absolutely. So the real selling point of Bowers is that you can take off each of these specific heads and replace it with application heads um, without having to purchase a new pistol grip. So the same pistol grip can be used with dozens of different heads, um, saving you a lot of time and hassle of buying other equipment that's required to measure the hole. And, and, and how would you use this in this case? So uh, this pistol grip and this ring, essentially the ring is, is calibrated and the pistol grip goes in the setting ring. You set that specific value and then you measure the, the uh, bore that you're trying to measure. And, and the setting ring comes with, with the head when you it get does. it? It comes as a pair? It does. Okay. Right. Yep. On top of the X-T3, uh, what we have is we have a couple other items. We have some smart plugs here. This is for your high production inspection, um, essentially high tolerance, um, basically your air gauging kind of accuracy um, and extremely repeatable. Uh, Two-point spherical um, anvils in there uh, designed to give you your roundness and other items that the X-T3 might not be able to give you. Um, and then moving up in the line here you have uh, the Ultima. The Ultima is essentially the X-T3 but a little bit more accurate so it's holding about a 40 millionths accuracy. Um, Comes, it, it, it requires a display, um, but basically comes with the same kind of anvil, except it's ceramic instead of uh, carbide. And what was the accuracy on this one? This one's 40 millionths. Um, the accuracy of the X-T3 is just over a tenth, okay. so still pretty accurate. Yeah, well, 40 millionths is really accurate. <laughs> really accurate. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and also, I think you had one, uh, you were showing me earlier, uh, like a groove, some sort of internal groove. or. Sure. So this is also part of the X-T3 series, the X-T-H. Um, it's a standard pistol grip, the same pistol grip that I was using previously, except this one has a groove head on it. So if you have a difficult time measuring internal grooves, you essentially go in, you set the ring on the master, and then you measure your specific groove that you're trying to, to quantify. Um, so there's not really any easy way to do this currently. This would be um, one of the best ways to do it and one of the easiest and most repeatable ways of doing it. Okay. Well, um, as, we're, as we make our way down to Van to, uh, you're going to show us, uh, I think, uh, the Silvac at the end. But why don't you take a, uh, tell us a little bit about what else is in here as we're walking, walking sure. through here. So this is uh, uh, the Tremos Lab Concept Premium. It's designed uh, to calibrate and certify all of your hard gauging. So that's your pin gauging, your, plug, your plugs, your thread plugs, your rings, your thread rings, calipers, micrometers, indicators, essentially anything that you guys have for hard gauging it that needs certification and calibration, this guy can do. Um, you can see how accurate it is. It's dancing just over, a, you know, just a couple of millionths right now on a vibrating bus. Right, right. So. Um, and then a op an optical, uh, 3D optical gauge here? Sure. Or? So this is, uh, this is our Beatty system. It's uh, owned by the Bowers Group. So the same company that does the bore gauging also does the vision. Okay. Um, They've been making vision systems for the last 30 years, and they're one of the strongest companies um, in the world that do vision. Um, comes with a touch probe, uh, really nope. reliable, really easy. Is this just profile, or is this 3D? Fully 3D. Fully 3D. Full okay. Fully 3D. That part on there, it would excel on that part. Fully automated, um, really easy. Okay. Uh, what, a uh, height gauge over here, or what? Yeah, so these are Tremos height gauges. The campus is right next to Silvac. Essentially, these are some of the easiest height gauges um, designed for the operator, not for the PhD engineer. So everything's right on the screen. You have um, you know, step lengths it can do. It does diameters. It gives you max min points, delta function. Um, literally everything that you'd be looking for in a height gauge without having to dig through a couple different menus to find it. And uh, what's this little puppy over here? So this is the smaller one. This is the Silvac height gauge. Uh, it's, it's 
more automated in the back, so instead of having to wind the gauge, you actually have a paddle shifter in the back. So very similar in accuracy, about a tenth and a half, about two tenths throughout the entire range of the gray, of the gray Silvec here, or the gray Trimos here. This white guy here is holding about 40 millions. And I see we have a wide variety of uh, Fowler um, uh, dial indicators here, it looks like. Absolutely. So these guys, um, with the exception of these three, are all lifetime warranty products that Fowler offers. Uh, essentially, you have a couple different um, resolutions. So, you know, your accuracy, uh, depending on the accuracy that's required, you have a couple different selections. Um, IP67 rated, full Bluetooth capability, um, really robust. And of course, Fowler makes a, a wide range of just uh, your standard uh, micrometers, uh, calipers, and so forth, right? So these are our uh, economy line. We have basically um, just a, a plethora of different tools here that we offer in the Toolathon, which is our um, quarterly deals. Uh, we essentially we sell a little bit of everything, um, but for the stuff that you don't necessarily want to pay, you know, Swiss quality for, and you just need right. it for kind of a weekend warrior kind of deal, you can purchase some of these guys as well. Oh, also, really good quality. And finally, what do we got down here? The Silvac. Scan 52. So the Silvac Scan 52 is a, a fully automated inspection unit for all of your turn parts. Uh, basically, you spend time writing the program initially, um, and then once the program is written, you just hit the play button. Um, another feature of the gauge is the fully autonomous reverse engineering that, that exists on the gauge. So if I just click this white button, what it does is it goes through a full scan of that part. And what that's doing is, is a green LED is shooting up between the bottom, casting a shadow, and then that shadow is being digitized down to a micron accuracy on the screen. Um, so then it takes what it sees, graphs it on the screen, and then reverse engineers the step diameters, step lengths, step radii, and step angles that it sees. So it could be used for reverse engineering or, or inspection, uh, I'm assuming, right? First article, um, final inspection of all of your turn parts. Okay. Um, it also has the capability to spin a full 360 degrees um, on the fixture uh, and pick up all of your geometric tolerances. So that's your roundness, runout, concentricity, cylindricity. Um, basically everything. Now, do do you send the the, the mobile uh, lab here? Do you send that out to uh, particular companies, or can they request it to come out, or how does that work? They can request it, or if we're talking to a company about something specific, and we say, hey, we have that on our mobile tech center, we'll literally bring the mobile tech center that same week, um, if it's in the area, to their um, business. Yeah, I'm so. sorry. I keep calling mobile lab mobile tech center. I'm no, sorry. Right. I'm sorry. Okay, okay, okay. So you, if, if somebody wants you to come out and you're in the area, you could come out, or you could tell them you, we're going to be at such we'll such an expo frame. or something like that. Yep, okay. absolutely. We'll give them a time frame, and then we'll organize a, a meetup with them. Okay. Send them pre-rival packages, and it's really a great experience. So okay. perfect. Well, John Filipides, a Fowler. Uh, thanks for being with us. Thank you very much. Hey, and that was uh, <laughs> that was actually a pretty uh, that was actually a pretty pretty interesting little trip there. Um, <clears throat> Big old long van, yeah, and a lot of yeah. lot of equipment. It is, in, it is, you, is you can see there, and uh, as as John said, there is uh, they have three of these vans. They'll come to your site if you make an appointment, mm -hmm. or <clears throat> very often these these vans are going to different trade shows and stuff. You can always go there and uh, take a look at a lot of the a uh, lot of the equipment that uh, Fowler has. <clears throat> excuse me, right there inside that van. So. Precision Metrology Lab on Wheels, pretty much. Uh, yeah, yeah. And ba uh, okay. so if, if you're actually, if you're interested, uh, it's FowlerPrecision.com, it, is that? It's, it's, it's FWFowler.com, uh, I think is the, is the link. I think it's a link on, on the player page as well, if you right. check that yep. out. Great. All right, well, that's our show for today. Thanks to Chad Keimel of Omnix for joining us on the show. And, and don't forget, Chad's going to be presenting a webinar with us this coming week on Tuesday, titled Enterprise Quality Management, ISO 9001. AS9100, ISO 13485, or IATF 16949, Implementations Made Easy. And that's this coming Tuesday, April 11th at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. So check that one out and register for it when you get the reminder. That's right. And thanks to uh, Chad for joining us on the show. Thanks as well to John Filipides of Fowler for coming over and showing us their great new mobile tech center as well. Uh, you can visit Fowler online, as Mike said, at Fowler... FowlerPrecision.com, that's it. FowlerPrecision.com, yep, yep. there you go. FowlerPrecision.com if you'd like one of their mobile tech centers to swing by your facility. And there is a link, I do remember, there is a link to that, uh, to a web page on the mobile tech facility on the player yep. page down there so you can take a look at that. Check that out. All right, well, thank you all for joining us. Uh, that's our show for today. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll see you next week with another big, uh, big week of Quality Digest. And we'll be back with Quality Digest Live next Friday, so check us out then. So long. Bye.